Hello everyone and welcome to Workforce Windsor Essex, a virtual look inside transportation. My name is Samantha Dallow. I'm a project coordinator and research associate with Workforce Windsor Essex. Although we are gathered here virtually today, we acknowledge that Windsor, Ontario sits on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. We begin with our essential worker career portal, where you can read about local people working in essential positions throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and find out about the most common positions sought out by employers that were deemed essential positions. You'll also learn that a lot of these positions are consistently in demand in Windsor, Essex. You can also watch previous virtual sector events to learn about our growing sectors. There's also a transportation and warehousing career portal, which can be found under job seekers and research and occupation. You'll find interviews with local transportation workers. You might see a familiar face. Uh, Holly Noble, who's one of our guest speakers, is also featured on that page. So what is transportation and warehousing? Transportation uh, is about uh, passengers and goods, warehousing and storing goods, and providing goods and services to these establishments. It's the industry of moving people and things from place to place. Now I'd like to welcome my colleague and research associate, Nick. Go ahead, Nick. Perfect. Okay, perfect timing. So in short, it's the industry of moving people and places from place to people and things from place to place. But how does this look regionally? So there's about 8,900 local workers in the transportation and warehousing sector in Windsor Essex, which is, while in, well, maybe a surprise to some who have never really looked into the sector, is not necessarily a surprise, as we're an important hub for Canadian and North American trade. For example, we have the Ambassador Bridge, which actually represents about 25% of a Canadian and American trade. Next. Highway 401 near Gray Parkway. The Windsor Detroit Tunnel, Windsor National Airport, which is where we get the initials YQG. Uh, we have several ra railway networks. And in tw around 2024, we'll have the Gordie Howe International Bridge. So we'll have two large scale international bridges in just our region alone. Next slide, please. So just to kind of give an idea, I mean, we figured we would show a couple of pictures to kind of determine which of these careers are in transportation warehousing that you see. So you have someone behind the bus, you have someone call center, you have someone working on a forklift, and you have someone coding on a computer. And while you may think that only some of these would be in there, maybe the people that are on the forklift or driving the bus, all of these actually would be considered transportation warehousing careers. Next slide. So just to give an idea of what is in demand currently right now as of our last, uh, our last sector report in April 2021, uh, the most in-demand position were transport truck drivers, followed by delivery and courier service drivers and material handlers, which work in warehouses, transport goods in between parts of this, the facility, dispatchers, who would be like that man that you saw with the headset, and as well, customs, ships, and other brokers, so people that procure these products in these set kinds of settings. Next slide, please. And for the rounding out the top 10, we have storekeepers and parts persons basically manage establishments and obtain product. Bus drivers, subway operators, and other transit operators. Now, we may not have a subway in Windsor-Essex, but we do have plenty of bus lines that will require drivers to transport passengers to and from their destinations. Uh, couriers, messengers, and door-to-door -door distributors, so people that work at industries like FedEx or UPS, as well as accounting technicians and bookkeepers. And finally, letter carriers. So as we're seeing that there's a quite a wide variety in the sector alone that is just active regionally. But next slide, please. Looking into the future, Adam Pernasiliki of Laser Transport, a local trucking firm, has noted in a write-up from his that from telecom to cybersecurity, audiovisual to electrification, big business is piling into Windsor with regards to an increasing emphasis on new technologies that are being needed in the sector today and into the future. For example, IT and computer engineering grads will be needed to develop new systems that involve automation and other types of AI that, while already part, becoming active parts of the industry, are becoming even more important. And we'll be hearing from some of our panelists as to the importance of these changing technologies as they come through. 
So there we go, a little demystifier of the sector of transportation warehousing, but I'll leave a lot of that demystification to our wonderful panelists that we have on, which we can now get started with. Thanks, Nick. I'd like to thank our panelists for being here today. To start, we have Karen O'Mara. Um, she'll be answering some questions about the sector. She'll be answering some questions about her experiences and her occupation. Um, so thank you, Karen O'Mara, for joining us today. She's the branch manager of Switzer Cardi Transportation. Take it away, Karen. Thank you. I don't know if it's a privilege or I don't know to be first, is it? <laughs> I'll take it's it as a privilege. privilege. Anyway, um, so thanks, Nick. And thank you, Sam. Um, Nick, I had the pleasure of uh, a little telephone interview with you a few several weeks ago. And uh, that's what got this ball rolling. And it, uh, I found it fascinating as I talked about something that I've done for so, so long, um, and to put it in that perspective. So um, I appreciate you asking me to be a panelist here today. And I'll just, uh, I'll just start here and say good morning to everyone. Um, Karen O'Mara, branch manager at Switzer Cardi Transportation, and that's located in Leamington. Uh, we look after the uh, south end of Windsor-Essex. There, there are other operators within Windsor-Essex, um, but we look after from Leamington straight across to Amherstburg and, and up into Windsor um, transporting students. So that's uh, we're located on Seacliff Drive here in Leamington. So good morning. And uh, I want to say that maybe due to my age and tenure in the transportation industry, uh, you might say that in 1987, I was lucky, blessed, fortunate, whatever you want to use to be at the right place at the right time in my life. And so began my school bus uh, career, school bus business career. So I graduated grade 13. None of you even know what grade 13 is, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but I graduated grade 13 thinking I was going to be an x-ray technician. Uh, no, that uh, I was then guided into uh, enter college for a business degree. However, that didn't really seem like a fit for me, and I felt I had considerable business knowledge even at that young age, as my father was a self-employed entrepreneur. So therefore, he was my first mentor. So after starting a family, I was looking for a part-time job that would fit with my other job, a stay-at-home mom, and a school bus driver was a terrific option. So I did that for a year and then assumed that full-time position in the office. And it's then that my transportation, uh, or then the transportation became my life uh, and has for the last 35 years. So today, to just walk into a managerial role in a transportation business, or at least the school bus business, you would very likely require or need a college or university degree. Uh, but in our business, we often promote from within, just as I did 35 years ago. So there's no, um, no shame at starting here and working your way up and gaining that experience as well within the industry. Um, the school bus business is all about people and not just young people uh, that we transport. I manage over 150 people here in this one location. And the majority of them are part-time school bus drivers uh, but the rest of the staff are made up of full-time mechanics, dispatchers, uh, shop assistants, safety personnel, uh, administrative assistant, and sales and customer service. So we're well-rounded team and uh, 150 altogether. So transportation is so much more than just the wheels on the pavement. I continued my education as I worked. Um, taking every possible course or seminar that would improve my computer skills. Yes, I started with a typewriter. Uh, so uh, I needed to improve those as, as the computer became more and more obviously uh, vital to all businesses and as technology still evolves and is becoming vital. Um, so I would improve my computer skills, uh, HR skills, labor relations, safety knowledge, accounting and uh, financial budgeting knowledge. I took public speaking courses, accident investigation, organizational uh, courses, learned some legislation, and even took communication and writing courses. So you kind of need it all in that, uh, that manager's position. And uh, I just kept taking everything I could and uh, to help me move forward in my position. 
So I did find good mentors again within the business. Uh, their success meant a lot to me and I, I learned from them. So that helped. So a uh, school bus driver to a receptionist, to operations manager, to a branch manager. I did move throughout the organization and continued to be a sponge in learning. So that will never hurt you. Just uh, keep your mind open and your ears open and, and uh, everything that you, you can learn, take it with you. Uh, even if you don't use it now, you may in the future. So I just learned as much as I could. I changed offices and locations, uh, some small, some large, some rural, some urban. Uh, some dealt with only the general student population and some um, only with special needs students, but most of them were a mix of both. I even left the actual school bus company uh, for a few words, years, sorry, and worked at, the, uh, worked at the school board in the transportation department. Uh, very technical position. Um, they are doing the planning and the routing. They use a geo query, excuse me, a bus planner um, program that routes, and many of even listening here may take a bus. So how you're put onto a bus is very technical and uh, very interesting. So that background really helped. So I was glad to have, even though I left the bus business for a couple of years, I was still in the school bus transportation business and I was very happy to learn the other end of that. So um, school bus driver to planner to, you know, all of the other jobs in between, it's, um, it really has helped me that way. Um, so, but I did come back to, uh, to school busing. I truly love what I do. Uh, since I think it's one of the most diverse and evolving industries and in no way a mundane business uh, to be part of, uh, that is for sure. So we move people. The majority of our people are often young students and we call them precious cargo and often say we are transporting our future. Parents sometimes apprehensively, but they do hand their children over to us uh, to get them to school ready to learn. Uh, we pick them up again to ensure they're safely returned uh, to their families. Relationships are built along the way. School bus, school bus drivers can make a difference in a child's life. And although I'm no longer riding the bus, I believe that the culture we promote, we train and teach at Switzer Cardi Transportation, it really means that we're all part of making the difference in that child's life. We work with school boards, transportation consortiums, school administrative staff and parents. And besides the little people we transport, we look after all the grown-ups as well. Our guest workers uh, in the region are picked up at the greenhouses and brought into town to bank and do their shopping. Uh, sports teams taken to their venues, brides and grooms need us, and the wineries are a popular group function that requires safe transportation. University groups, seniors going to theater, girl guides to summer camp, the list is endless. We also operate uh, out of this location, the municipality of Leamington Transit Buses. And uh, we're quite proud to be working with the municipality of Leamington in that, uh, in that way. We currently employ an apprentice diesel mechanic. We have for the last several years. I do believe he's, uh, he'll be writing his test this year or this, yeah, before the end of this year. And uh, we also have a local co-op student uh, that we uh, took on from, I believe he was Essex High School. And now we've hired him uh, for the summer as well. So uh, we're, we're just so pleased to be able to help in the community that way and help others and, uh, and have everybody learn a little bit more about Switzer Cardi and the school bus business. We're very much part of the community. Uh, networking and sitting on various boards have helped me through my career, often in uh, boards uh, involving children, such as the Halton Women's uh, Shelter. I did leave it, live out in Burlington uh, originally, uh, but also uh, involved with the Leamington and District Chamber of Commerce as I came here um, and have sponsored many local teams and projects. We like to stay involved. We, we hire from the community. We drive for the community. We are very much part of the community. So, in this business, you just keep learning. School bus, uh, school busing is diverse, people moving business that requires technological experience, working towards efficiencies and that have us working smarter, not harder, uh, but never ever skimping on safety of our own people or those we transport. 
So you may think of school busing as being a 10 month job, but I can assure you it is not. It is the most asked question that I get. So what do you do in the summer? Uh, most of our drivers are laid off during that time, but I can assure you that all the full-time staff are kept very busy. We have another school year to prepare for in September, every September. So we're hiring, training, cleaning, maintaining, teaching, etc. Even though COVID, uh, even through COVID rather, Switzer Cardi kept all full-time staff uh, working. Uh, sometimes we seem busier uh, without the buses on the road since we were adapting as well. But we kept in touch with our staff. We communicated often and with as much positivity as we could um, since we were all dealing with the unknown. We continued to pay all of our employees through the school closures and everyone was ready, willing, and able to return as, as soon as the government uh, opened the schools and we're kind of waiting on that at this moment. So I just encourage you to check out the uh, website at www.switzer-cardi.com and read up on those biographies of Jim Switzer, uh, very respected in the industry, been in the business a little longer than I, I think, and Doug Cardi. And to see and read the diversity of my job um, the, and the people that I have mentioned. Um, if I can ever serve as a mentor to anyone, I would do my very best. I know how much my mentors meant to me. And my success is due to many of them and their influence in my career and my life. Um, children have to get to school and people need to be moved from point A to point B and back again. So I know how thankful I am that I've been part of this industry. Um, I'm very thankful for that first manager that uh, took a chance on me. And I yeah, still thank him to this day. However, I'm also proud of the work that I invested in improving myself over the years. Uh, I have a plaque in my office uh, that reads, success is the sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out. So in other words, if you put the effort in, you will be successful. So thanks for my, so much for allowing me to, uh, Nick and Sam and all of you and listening, and the other panelists, thanks for letting me uh, tell my story this morning. And I hope uh, it gave you some insight into the school bus industry. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karen. What a great way to kickstart our, uh, our virtual sector event, Karen. I think we're going to learn a lot today that uh, there are uh, many paths uh, that we take to you know, get to our occupation and our vocation. So. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And it's, it's true. Uh, I will remember all my school bus drivers. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they were fantastic human beings and they were role models. And uh, they made that morning truck to school are, you know, way, way more exciting <laughs> as a child. Um, thank you once again, Karen. You're welcome. Next, That's I, good. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Jason Lee. Um, so I'm just going to go over here. And Nick, do you mind starting Jason's uh, video and pinning it for me? There we go. Awesome. Jason Lee is the founder and CEO of Smart Cone. Um, and I'm going to pass it along to him. He has this great background over there. I see he came prepared. Thank you so much, Jason. Take it away. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, and that was great, Karen. Um, very, uh, very good. I enjoyed that. Um, I'm, I have a different path, just like I'm sure everybody has their own unique path. And uh, my first, uh, I guess, contribution to this before I get into what I do in and the rest of that is um, the challenge I had in high school an education, you know, as a whole. And looking back at what I could have done to support myself more then. And I think that's probably, you know, that's the best thing that I, that I can think of right now. When I was uh, in high school, I, I loved being in high school. I thought it was great. You know, I thought about you know, sports and and uh, friends and, you know, life and enjoying things and freedom. I got more freedom, kind of being my own independent person. And, and I, liked, I liked the classes. I liked, you know, the, the challenge of some of the English and math and science and all these things. It was fun stuff. 
but it was hard for me to figure out what that meant to my life. You know, when people ask me, what do you want to do as a career? And what are you going to go to college for? I'm like, I don't know. So I literally applied for like a whole bunch of stuff. You know, it was more getting accepted uh, into school was my biggest concern as opposed to what am I going to do? And then I heard all sorts of stories about, you know, uh, people go to school for one thing, they get a job for another. And that made it even harder because I thought, how do I know that I'm right? And that's like a big commitment for me to focus on to find out I might not like it. And, uh, and that was, that was the big, I guess, challenge for me and, uh, transportation back when I was, a, when I was young, didn't have all of the diversity of things that you can do in it. Like it does now, like you can see there's airplanes in the back there and, and uh, we have technology that goes in transportation. It's a whole bunch of other stuff, but the point is <clears throat> transportation now, uh, you know, Nick gave a really great introduction to that includes almost everything. You can do all sorts of jobs in transportation. And so uh, that's not like it was when I was a kid. It was more like the mechanics like Karen was talking about, you know, uh, drive, change oil, mechanic, this kind of stuff. Not like that anymore. So, um, <clears throat> so you know, as a, as a, how that relates to you, what do you study and what do you figure and so on and so forth? And I guess my biggest piece of advice on what courses you take and so on is that the science, technology, uh, you know, um, math and um, engineering, the STEM, I guess I said that backwards, but that those are, are really great things for you to learn to find out how your mind works and if it interests you at all. You know, that's really what high school is all about is figuring out what you're good at and where you want to go. And the rest of it, you know, as you get into college and so on, you kind of figure out where you fit in with, uh, with a job and a career path. And then once you get in the career path, you can, again, continue to evolve it, which uh, Karen was talking about. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about what, what I do and how I got here, just to kind of show you that path that I've just laid out for, you know, education is very important in, in high school to figure out your own personal interest and see how your mind works with the education so you can begin to shape that. And that would be my advice looking back at, uh, at how it all unfolded for me. <clears throat> so Smartcon Technologies is my, uh, my company. I started it by spending uh, some time in Afghanistan with the U.S. military around transportation. They had a challenge of moving vehicles from one place to another uh, through uh, really dangerous locations, uh, trying to you know, avoid getting running into IEDs. And uh, while I was there, I met a group of people that, that called route clearance people, which is really interesting to me. I like action. So I went to you know, Afghanistan and Kuwait and all these places and, and thought it was uh, amazing. But uh, basically what it meant was that uh, they want, the, the military wanted a way to quickly clear a route and make sure it was safe. And so that's, that's where my mind went, but ding, I love that. And right then, right when that happened, I thought, geez, I wish I had trigonometry. <laughs> I wish I paid more attention in math. Now I've got to hire somebody else who can do it. And, uh, and so I did. And that's, that's right when I first started realizing that uh, if I had paid more attention in high school, because I love that kind of stuff, it would have been a foundation for me. So anyway... I started working on a system, a technology system that, uh, that was able to deploy sensors and collect all this information quickly and, and make sure that people were safe. That's, that's what Smartcom does. So after, you know, I played around in the military for a bit, I came uh, you know, back into uh, Canada and, and looking at transportation. Well, moving a, you know, a driverless vehicles around, shuttle buses with no driver, it's, it's a very similar problem. We've got to make sure that everyone's safe, coordinating safety. So uh, we created uh, an infrastructure, like a little traffic controlling infrastructure that watches the pedestrians and the autonomous vehicles and it coordinate, coordinates safety. We use that same technology uh, and we created a uh, solution for tracking goods uh, and doing automatic inventory for DHL and other big sh uh, shipping companies, meaning that we have a forklift that automatically 
moves boxes around and tells you where they are. So if you need to find one, you can just go to our screen, look for a box, and it'll tell you exactly where it is in the warehouse. And that saved huge amounts of times on, on finding boxes and all this stuff for freight moving. And, and now we're doing advanced manufacturing robotics and a whole bunch of really cool stuff. And all of it requires <clears throat> different jobs. Obviously, the uh, math for uh, doing a trilateration and triangulation, which is the solving for X, Y, Z and plotting in the graphs and all that stuff. That's cool. And then, uh, you know, um, software programming. So making interfaces useful, data analytics and research and statistics and all these things. There's just so many jobs in it. My son, who's uh, grade eight, going to grade nine, says to me the other day, I don't like art. I don't understand it. He's a very science math kind of guy. I, I think art's crazy. Like, I don't know why anybody takes it. And I said, okay, do you like the look of my car, my dashboard in my car? He goes, yeah. Well, that was made by you know injection molds, which is tool and dye and all these things. But do you like the way it looks? He goes, yeah, I'd love the way it looks. Okay. So if it didn't look good, would you still want to be in the car? He goes, no, that's art. Somebody, somebody got it. They had a vision of how the new cars are going to look and, and created that shapes and that beautiful thing. And this may not be abstract art. It's fine art. It's design. And that's how art relates to, you know, somebody gets in a car or uses a tool or something and they like it. They love the way it looks and they love the way it feels. There's an art to that. And so he said, wow, that's actually really, that's a good point. Maybe I do like art, but I like a certain type of art. And it, it's, you know, these are the kinds of things that when you're young, you know, it's really difficult. And, and I think in education, we could probably do a better job of just saying, hey, it's a raw talent, you know, and just like the art example I gave my son, um, you know, if you understood at your age that you're not necessarily trying to pick exactly who you're going to be in 20 years from now. What you're doing is finding out what you like and what you're good at and what you want to invest in, like Karen was saying, so that when you find one of the many jobs in transportation, and believe me, that is the future. That's the future is transportation of everything. And, and when, you, when you start to look at where do I want to fit in in that, do I want to work with people? Do I want to work with software? Do I want to work with hardware? Do I want to just build stuff and just keep it simple? There are so many different things that... Uh, that, that you can do just anything you want to do and high school is a great place for you to figure out uh, that path and so for me if I was going to hire people which we're how we do hire people and uh, we do have co-op students and we have offices in Windsor as well by the way um, I would hire people who can do software programming I would hire people who uh, know wireless systems and who can do networking I would hire people who can do um, uh, what else? Uh, drivers. We need drivers. We actually need to, uh, even on autonomous shuttles, because we operate four shuttle services now, we need, to have, we need to have an onboard engineer who uses basically a gaming controller, looks like an Xbox controller, to drive the vehicle around if there's a problem. You know, there's all sorts of different skill sets. So, you know, that's <laughs> really what I have to offer is that, uh, you can do anything you want to do in transportation. It's really important, though, that you figure out what you like and then start to be good at doing that. Pay attention in school, for sure. Make sure that, you know, if you don't like a, if you don't like a subject, still do a good job of it anyway, because life is filled with things and every job has an element that you don't want to do. Well, okay, suck it up and do it anyway. But just focus on the, on the, on the items that you do like doing and then map your career to that and trust that transportation really has whatever it needs. Now, I'm just going to explain as a wrapping it up, this picture in the background. So I don't know how well you can see it on my screen. It looks pretty small, but there's an airplane just kind of right, right here. And then in front of it is a pylon or a cone. So we got our name by that, that cone. It was empty inside. So I put in technology, which created the very first term smart cone. And the purpose of it is that on the ground, this is a ramp at a, at a private airport in Florida. And there are $7 billion a year spent on fixing when somebody bangs a go-kart or a golf cart or another plane just into that plane, like just sitting there. Somebody moves another plane by tugging it and they hit the wing. $7 billion a year spent 
on fixing those kinds of things. Well, there could be a driver driving who needs to pay more attention, somebody who didn't, uh, who wrongly estimated a turn, a whole bunch of things there. But the point is, smart cone creates an invisible barrier around the airplane to provide warning so that a driver who's moving an airplane you know, with a tug or driving the airplane on itself or whatever it may be, knows when they're about to hit that ahead of time and flashes a light and plays a sound to stop them. Just like your cars now, your parents' cars or your car, when you're driving and you go into that lane, you're crossing to another lane, it vibrates the steering wheel and tells you, you know, uh, you're going into the wrong lane. Same exact thing. So we do that by putting a smart cone around things like airplanes, buses, forklifts, whatever, to help protect people and keep them safe. That takes a lot of different careers that are all based around science, math, uh, engineering, technology, software development, customer service. There's just so many jobs that you can do, you know? So really the world is your oyster. Just, it's really important though, that you pay attention and you do the, the work. So later on, you're not like me where you go, why didn't I think, you know, uh, trigonometry, uh, why didn't I focus on that more? It would have made me a lot more money, but uh, anyway. That's my, that's my contribution. Thanks so much, Jason. Yeah, I had many of those moments too. I was like, oh, if I only paid attention a little more. Um, but hey, that's why other people do those jobs, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I just want to bring up, you know, you brought up a really important question and you said, how do I know that I'm right? And Karen touched on this. And I, you know, what I think we'll learn along the way is that, you know, it's important to do, oh, how do you know I'm right? It's important to do what you like and the right people will uh, mentor you. And like Karen said, you'll also invest in yourself and um, you know, you'll get to where you're meant to be. And similar like to what you said about, um, you know, interest transitioning, you know, arts to tool and die, you know, to the transportation and warehousing sector. So uh, lots of things to consider. And on that note, thank you so much, Jason. We appreciate it. Uh, we learned a lot uh, about what you do, and uh, I think it helps us segue really nicely into our next uh, speaker, Holly Noble. Thanks so much again, Jason. Okay, so we have Holly Noble with us today, and she is a transport truck driver, and I'm just going to get her video up here as well. Okay. Holly, can yes, you hear I can me hear okay? You. Okay, awesome. So Holly, I just would like for you to talk about your experiences and what led you to your career, uh, starting with your high school education and any post-secondary or any certificates you might have uh, received sure. along the way. Um, I, I, okay, so I, I completed high school um, in grade 12. Um, I had originally been accepted to St. Clair College to be a paramedic, but unfortunately I had suffered a brain injury at that time and I wasn't able to follow through and go with, through with the paramedic program. So I actually stayed fifth year at school. Um, although I was already graduated, I just wanted to stay in school. Um, from there, I enrolled at St. Clair College in Chatham to be a developmental service worker. Um, it took me four years to do the two-year course because of my brain injury. I was going back and forth um, to Georgia for treatment every few months. Um, so it took me a little longer to complete that. But as I was in college for that program, I had also started working. Um, when I completed that program, um, unfortunately, DSWs, which is what I went to school for, were no longer um, available for hire. So I ended up working as a personal support worker, a PSW, um, for a company called Community Living. Um, I worked with them for the first six years of my adult life. Um, I truly loved my job. I loved working with people with disabilities. Um, problem being, my the hours that I was receiving were not consistent, and it became very hard for me to pay my bills because I could not consistently see where my money was coming from. Um, so with that being said, um, I know others who were in the transport truck driving business. Um, I consulted with them and on a whim, I decided to go and um, 
get my AZ license. So that was a step-by-step process in itself, um, starting with a, a physical from a doctor. Um, you are required to get a physical done. Um, and then from there, I had to write my A um, test, my class A test, just like you would go write your G or your G1. Um, once you have that, I went to um, a school called North Star Truck Driving School. It's in Windsor. Um, it's an accredited school. You do need to go to an accredited school. You have to make sure that they're, they're legitimate um, to get your license. So I proceeded um, with truck driver training. I started with my Z, which is my air brake endorsement. That was an, a weekend class. Um, I graduated that top of my class um, and proceeded to learn how to drive a truck. So the first day I went, um, the very first day they, they put me up in a truck and I said, all right, let's go on the road. So that was a little bit intimidating. Um, but I did really well. Um, and, um, I, I graduated after, you know, a month and, um, started my career at that time as a truck driver with a company called Amex Freight and they were great. Um, I have we are recently um, switched to a company called LKQ Corp, and they're excellent as well. Um, but that was my process into getting to, into truck driving. I primarily wanted a job that I can work more hours. And as a truck driver, I can work up to 70 hours a week if I wish to do so. Um, so that was my, my general idea. I need to make more money. I need to be able to pay my bills. Um, I wanted to be comfortable live humbly. And truck driving was the right route for me at that time. And I was very, very pleasantly surprised as to how much I actually love working in this industry. And that's my journey to get to being a truck driver. That's awesome, Holly. I like this, you know, career realism, you know, for a lot of us millennials, you know, Gen Zers, we're, we're realizing that, you know, we want to make money, we want to um, get into an occupation that is in demand. And we also want to be able to work with our schedules and, you know, live a comfortable life. So I appreciate that career realism. And I think um, it will reach a lot of our viewers today. I kind of wanted to ask, um, is there anything Oh, we have actually a question here from Linda. She asked, sure. can you please talk about the age requirements and experience needed to get in now? And Absolutely. Add to that, is there anything specific to Windsor, uh, the Windsor region that you need certification for or knowledge of uh, being a, a truck driver? Okay. You, um, yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, in Windsor, it's, um, it, it's pretty well the same um, over all of Ontario. You need to be 18 years of age or older um, to get your A. Um, when you do get your A, let me also add, you also get your D, which is your dump truck, and that allows you to drive dump truck, cement truck, garbage truck, um, anything along those lines. So it's also just an added bit of security. Um, but in Windsor, well, first off, you... When you go into school, you have to do um, 103.5 hours now. The laws have changed since I got my license. Um, so you're required to complete 103.5 hours in truck and in classroom um, to learn. Um, you have to make sure you go to an accredited um, truck driving school. There's several in Windsor. There's North Star, which is what I went to. There's Ontario Truck Driving School. And then there's another one called Academy. Those are the three that I know of. Um, when I started into it, all I really had to do was give them a call and ask some questions and figure out what I needed to do to be able to get into, um, to get my career started as a trucker, um, to get my schooling started as a trucker. Um, but in Windsor, it's basically the same all across Ontario. And I'm more prevalent in the knowledge of Ontario as opposed to anywhere else in Canada. Um, it is most definitely a step-by-step -step process when it comes to uh, to getting into trucking. Awesome. Um, Linda has another uh, question here. She sure. says, we have been told by most employers that you need to be 25 years old for insurance purposes and also to be hired. For insurance purposes, that you need at least one year of AZ driving experience in addition to a fast card approved. That's, a, I think you was trying to get at, uh, at that fast card. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, absolutely. 
So the law does state that you have to be 18 years of age or older to get your license. There are a lot of companies, um, more so bigger, well-known companies that won't hire a driver unless you are, unless you have at least two years of experience and are over usually the age of 21. Some may say the age of 25. I, per I got my license when I was 25. I got really lucky with the company that I went to work for because I knew other people who worked for that company. They were willing to hire me right out of school and I gained quite a bit of experience and training through them as well. Um, but with that being said, there are a lot of companies that that won't hire you unless you have the two years experience. And it is, I mean, when, when you're driving a truck um, empty, your truck is 30,000 pounds. Fully loaded, you can weigh a little over 80,000 pounds. It's a, it's a very big responsibility. Um, and companies want to make sure you have that experience uh, to do so. But like I said, there are companies that will hire newer drivers and and that is honestly your best place to start gain experience once you gain experience you have so many more doors opened up to you as a truck driver um and and that includes your wage like if if you have more experience in the field you make a better wage Thanks so much, Holly. And then um, just one more question as, sure. as uh, Linda has been mentioning, because Windsor is a border city about the fast pass and about learning about, let's say, um, forms to fill out if you're carrying cargo, like you mentioned, across the border. Do you recommend, is that something that's um, offered in training because of Windsor or because uh, you're a truck driver in Windsor? Or do you recommend that's something that uh, someone who's interested invest in themselves, go get a fast pass? Uh, right about these forms um yeah any any information on that when it comes to a fast pass that is um that is not a requirement um some companies see it as an asset because uh, for example the last company i worked for amex they had specific loads that were quote fast loads um you cleared faster you got through the border faster and the only driver that can cross that was a driver with a fast card I don't have my fast card because I've never hauled cargo that required me to have that fast card. But with that being said, it is a very, um, it, it's not a bad thing to have. Um, I, I do recommend having it. I will very likely be getting one myself once the border is more open to back and forth travel for pedestrians. Um, but to do that, you, you have to basically go for an interview at customs on the US side and they interview you and make sure that you are a safe person. Um, FAST stands for fast and secure travel. Um, so they do a background check on you. They do an interview on you. And if they determine that you are safe to have a fast pass, then you are given that fast pass. Awesome, Holly, you've provided such great information and you know detailed information being someone from this region who's had these experiences. Um, and again, lots of career realism. And I and uh, just a note to any of our attendees, our participants, students, um, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q and A, uh, and they can be answered at the uh, end of our speaker series. Holly, thank you so much. Oh, you know, no I, I even learned a lot too. And what a journey uh, from where you started to where you are now. And to yes. know, like. That's a big part of it. Like, it's okay if you're not where you are meant to be, but you can definitely enjoy where, where you get, uh, where uh, you end up. Absolutely. I, I joke and I say I, I spent 12 grand on school just to end up working in a trade. <laughs> but right. you know what? It, it's, it's worked for me. And I, I just really quick wanted to touch base on, on the, the last prompt, um, what success means to me. And now if you ask me what success meant to me, uh, maybe five years ago, I would say money, right? I want to make some money. But the older I get and the more I work in this field, it's really made me realize that to me, success is loving my job. And I absolutely love my job. I enjoy going to work. Um, I enjoy my independence. I enjoy the confidence I've gained from this job, which is, which is like night and day of who I was before versus who I am now, all thanks to truck driving. But to me, success means peace. And success means living humbly and being happy with what you're doing and, and not dreading going to work every day, because that's an awful existence. Oh, my God. We love <laughs> to hear that honesty. Um, 
thank you so much just for reiterating that. I know I'm sure a lot of the panelists can agree with you. You gotta love your job. Yeah, we invest a lot at the beginning of our education, but if anything, there's anything students can take away is that if you really wanna do something, do it, you know, and um, it, you can have success in any sector, especially. Uh, absolutely. Leadership. And coming as, as a female driver, a young female driver, you very rarely see more like me. Um, and my only advice to people who, who are young and want to get into this, especially females, do it. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Do it. You're, you're more than welcomed into this industry. Thank you. Yes. Thank you again, Holly. Um, we're going to move on to our next panelist. I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Nick, who will be introducing our three next panelists. Thanks. All right. Thank, thank you so you. much, Sam. And thank you, everyone that's spoken so far. So moving on to our next panelist, we have John Biano. And I'll get you on there. All right. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, you mind just putting good. on your video? Okay. Oh, let me start that. There we go. There we go. Excellent. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, and thanks, uh, Sam and uh, Nick, for letting me be a panelist on this. Um, I'm probably the oldest person here, maybe. <laughs> I, I uh, graduated out of high school in 1976. Uh, I, I'm from the uh, Niagara Falls area. Uh, when I graduated, I was going to go into the uh, HVAC industry, like air conditioning and that. And I went to Niagara College um, to get into that business. And um, I found out that there was a lot of climbing on roofs and stuff like that, which I, I didn't really like. So uh, I wanted to stay in a trade. So I, I had the opportunity to come to Windsor. And uh, I got into the um, hydraulic trades, um, an industrial pipe fitter. Um, hydraulic mechanic by trade, and um, I did finish my college. I'm a hydraulic pneumatic uh, technician, got a college certificate in that. Um, I did that for about seven to eight years when I was younger, and um, I had the opportunity to move into the uh, engineering and design portion of um, designing systems in that. Uh, I worked for a, a, a a tool company here in Windsor, they're no longer here. But um, I did that for about nine years. I was in engineering for nine years. And then another door opened for me. Uh, I went into the industrial sales. I worked for a company out of Westland, Michigan, and I was into industrial sales. So I was on the road quite a bit, which I liked. I, I had to get out of the office. I wasn't really an office person. Um, I did that for uh, nine years, and then I became a territory manager for a large motion control company here in Canada and the U.S. Uh, I looked after mostly all of Ontario for distribution for um, uh, control systems, hydraulics, pneumatics, and it was mostly to do in the auto industry uh, with machine tool companies and that. Um, after around 2009, 2008, when the auto industry started to... Um, uh, get into trouble and there was tons of layoffs. I had an opportunity to move to the West Coast uh, and take care of um, distribution in the West Coast and for Vancouver, Vancouver Island, and mostly all of British Columbia. I lived on the West Coast for about nine years and I changed uh, career paths. I was doing um, for the marine industries and forest industries and uh, for shipping and stuff like that. So I, I stayed there for nine years and then I retired. And um, I started to make my path move back to Ontario because of my grandchildren. I've got eight grandchildren here. So we were gonna move back to Ontario. So we did a big six month trip through the US and I had a large motor home. Uh, and I'm not afraid to drive large vehicles and I like driving large vehicles. So I got back here and, and decided, well, I, I, I got to do something. I got to get out of the house. And, and somebody says, oh, why don't you become a school bus driver? And I, I had the opportunity. So I applied at Switzer Cardi and they gave me the opportunity to become a school bus driver. And it's one of the most rewarding jobs I've ever had to get up every morning and drive my kids to school. And uh, 
my reward is had seen those smiling little faces when they get off the bus and they're there safely. And um, I love doing it. I uh, love the camaraderie of uh, all the bus people and, and all the children and, and the high schoolers. And uh, that, that, that's, that's how I got into the um, school bus industry. So I really, really like it. And um, there, is, there is opportunity in, the, in, in our industry. Uh, that's 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 my path and and what a path that is again from niagara falls to the west coast to here starting engineering and all that i mean it's amazing and and again test uh, testament to just how many different ways that the transportation industry can really kind of grab onto people and see that that's what they want to pursue so and you mentioned how um the being able to see the precious cargo as karen put it coming on and off the bus and everything and how rewarding that, that is. I'm, would, would you say that seeing that and having that kind of position where you are transporting people who do rely on you on that, would that form a part of what success means to you? Oh, it does. Um, I, I find this one of the most rewarding jobs I've had in my whole career. Um, I really love getting up in the morning. And uh, one day we had a real foggy day and all the good guys got on the bus and and I says, please don't sit in the last few back rows there because in case we get hit from behind. And once I got all the kids to school and they were walking off the bus and they said to me, Mr. B, you're the best bus driver. You got us here nice and safe. And, and that is my, it really, really touched me. And it was, uh, that's my big reward in this industry. And I think that's really like, something that anybody no matter what sector they work in would would relate to as something that, like i mean how could you hear that and like not have that like warm your heart you know oh yeah it's oh yeah oh, i mean oh it's got me feeling all warm and fuzzy yeah um, it did. so i mean for someone who may hear that and say wow this is you know, i wouldn't have even thought of like i would have assumed necessarily i had to have that kind of position where you're taking care of kids and everything I, I would have had to become a teacher, work in the daycare or something like that. Oh, maybe, you know what, I'll become a bus driver. Maybe this is great. What would you um, say to that maybe young person who's considering uh, going into this as a career? Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. It has its moments, but it is a lot of fun. And two, I like being on driving on the outside. I like going places, uh, moving around, not in the office. Um, it, it is it's, it's a, it is a lot of fun. I, I really like doing it. Um, and it, it could, if you could do that for a while and you can move up, um, like Karen was saying, there is opportunities if, if, if you don't want to be a driver anymore. But uh, I, I'm, I'm at my peak with my driving. I like being on the outside. That's, I mean, that's that's the mark of a really excellent um, place to be at. To that again, even though there's opportunities for advancement and stuff, if you like where you're at, then that's where you can be. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's yeah. fabulous and really is uh, showing just how many different ways that you, someone's career path can lead towards something that they may have not expected and that they just found that they've grown to love. I think that that's 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 fabulous. Thank you so much, John, for again for okay. being here to speak. Thank you, Nick. So, oh, pardon. Thank you. Actually, I, I was just going to jump in and ask. We do have a question here from Linda. Um, I know you touched on it, but uh, if you can mention, you know, is there a specific age, you know, licensed training once again, just to reiterate to our students what age they can get into uh, school bus driving at? Um, I'm not 100% sure. I do think it is in the 20s. Uh, Karen can probably answer that, that uh, too, because yeah. uh, um I'm I'm in my 60s and I got in, but I, I know that it, it, it is around, um, I'm not sure, around 20, 21, maybe. It, can I, may I? Yes. You, Karen, is, yeah, you can ask Thank that. you. It's, uh, yes, 21 years of age. Um, and you, um, you do have to, medically, you have to be um, healthy. And it's not a, that's not a Swiss or Cardi thing. That's about your license. Um, and so you do have a, a medical form to fill out, uh, but 21 years, safe driving record, um, that kind of thing. And then um, most, I would say even all, but most uh, 
school bus companies have certification to do the training with the uh, with the ministry. So my safety specialist here is a driver development space safety specialist. We I interview, she trains, we get right on the, the big vehicle, right on the bus, there's videos, there's classroom time, and two or three three weeks, you know, um, we we want you successful, we set you up for success. Um, and again, safety is the priority and yeah, there you get your B license and you're good to go. Hope that helps. Excellent. There we go. I mean, look at this team in tandem here. This is excellent. Like it's, <laughs> oh, I, I love it. It's, it's fabulous. I'm glad we can get both of you on here. So thank you so much, John. And thank you, Karen, for jumping in on that question. Thank you, Sam, yeah. for grabbing that as well, too. So moving on to take a bit of a pivot and direction to our next speaker, we have Ed Dawson. Welcome, Ed. I'll just have the... Hey, thanks very much, Nick. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Awesome. So thanks again, you know, to you and Sam and to all the distinguished, you know, guests today and panelists. It's been awesome just hearing everyone's different experiences and their careers. And, you know, for me, I'm going to kind of uh, start it off just by talking a little bit uh, about an untraditional career, if you will, and kind of where it's led me today. And I think my theme is, you know, be prepared and kind of embrace uh, whichever direction that your career may take you. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's an exciting opportunity to try different things and to make sure that you're willing to try different things. And that's kind of where I'll start off. So um, I, my name is Ed Dawson and uh, I currently work with uh, Invest Windsor Essex. And uh, what we are, we're a regional economic development agency. So we are responsible for making sure that Windsor Essex from an economic perspective is doing well, you know, making sure that the companies that are here are thriving. We have the support that they need attracting new companies and industries into the region and also diversifying and making sure that we're staying on top of all these different trends and and as they relate to technology and that's kind of where my career is today but before I kind of go there I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, what I was in high school and what I was thinking of so when I was in high school you know much like many many students uh, it was always a challenge to realize what am I want to do what do I want to do with my life where am I going to go so I realized I was really good at the social sciences, good at business, good at economics. And um, so I decided that post-secondary, I went to university and I studied political science and economics. Wasn't sure where I was gonna go with that, but I ended up doing my undergrad and then I liked school a lot. So I ended up staying and, and being involved uh, at the University of Windsor and I did my master's. And then while I was doing that, um, I was working part-time at uh, TD Bank and I was doing that you know, working as a teller, CSR, to pay some bills and to kind of get some experience so that when I was done school, I kind of would have an opportunity to know, you know, maybe where my career would take me. And so, you know, long behold, at the end of uh, doing that, I, I was given an opportunity to join TD in a full-time capacity as um, a management trainee. And so my career essentially at TD spanned about 12 years worked uh, everywhere from a CSR to a financial service rep to a financial advisor to a manager. And uh, towards the end of my career, it was really unique. That's when an opportunity presented itself. And this is where I kind of say, you just never know where your career is going to take you. And you always keep those doors open. One of the clients that I dealt with had just recently sold his company and he had this transportation management software company, you know, a sector in an industry that I wasn't too familiar with, but he was looking for, uh, for some people who wanted to kind of join his team and take a leap of faith. And so, you know, after 12 years, it was a big leap of faith. You know, I had a family and I was married and son and I decided to go and uh, it was one of the best career decisions I could have made. So, you know, for anyone who doesn't know what transportation management software is, uh, it's really the back end that runs a transportation company. Um, so everything from being able to have a system that's on your computer to track every load that you get, to be able to invoice your clients, and most importantly, to be able to communicate with your drivers and using telematics and in-cab in uh, technology to communicate and know where the load is, uh, know if there's a problem and keep your, um, your customer up to date. So it was really interesting. So I got to talk to many cool companies that were in transportation logistics and, uh, and learn all about the sector. And, uh, you know, fast forward about four years uh, working with this company here in Windsor-Essex and really excited. 
And uh, and an opportunity came up to kind of use a little bit about my, use some of my schooling and and then kind of jump into economic development. And I was excited because one of the things I was going to do is I was going to uh, help invest or attract companies to the region. And I said, well, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in transportation logistics. And so that's really where part of my focus was, was looking at companies that would find this location as one of the best to set up a new place. And, you know, you've heard it at the beginning of the presentation, Nick mentioned it, you know, can't, Windsor Essex hosts the busiest commercial border crossing between Canada and the United States. And that's very important because uh, as, as I was, as I've been working in economic development, um, things started to change. Technology really started to taking to, to, to shift. And, you know, companies like Jason's really came front and center, Smart Cone. And we realized here in Windsor Essex that we are Canada's automotive capital. So one of two things is going to happen. If you, if you continue with just traditional automotive manufacturing, the way that we do things, well, there's a big possibility as things are changing so rapidly that we won't get an opportunity to participate in the changes in this industry. And so we realized that we have to rebrand, we have to pivot, and we have to focus on technology. And so fast forward to today, we are really pushing right now to be known as Canada's automobility capital. So you might ask what's automobility? Well, it's the a secure zero emissions movement of people, goods using advanced information technologies. And so that's kind of where we created this new department where I work called Automobility and Innovation. And then we started getting some government funding to help transition the Windsor-Essex economy and to connect through our partners within the province of Ontario, to connect within Canada and to work with global companies that are looking to come to, uh, to a place in Canada and, and hopefully make them come to Windsor-Essex. And so this picture that you see behind me is pretty cool. So this is Canada's largest virtual reality cave that was designed for connected and autonomous vehicle testing. So we got funding from the province to be able to create this environment and it's a simulation lab. And what's unique about this is that when you think about some of the things that Jason and his company are working on and many companies that are working on connected and eventually autonomous vehicles, well, those autonomous vehicles need a lot of testing. And so we found a really niche opportunity here to create a lab where you can do safe testing of technology that won't affect or God forbid kill anybody as, as you're testing. So our use case was let's look at cross-border technologies because of the border and let's look at commercial vehicles and that's why the scale of what we built was so big. So we realized there's a big opportunity here and you know, just to kind of give you some ideas, we have this driving simulator where you can sit in there and you can mimic driving through an environment like a test track, or you can let the vehicle drive itself. So this is, it lets you test everything from sensors on the vehicle to autopilot, to cameras, to radar, um, anything you can imagine, we can safely test it. And what's really cool is that you'll find this summer, we're gonna be launching, um, we're calling a digital twin of the Windsor Detroit tunnel. So we're gonna have a replica of the Windsor Detroit tunnel so that we can start testing some of these technologies. And we're hoping to do a pilot with Jason and his team so that we can demonstrate that if there is an error, if there's a problem, we want to work out the kinks before we go to any other government agencies and say, I think we're ready to do a real live test pilot in the actual tunnel. And eventually in at the, you know, the new Gordie Howe International Bridge that's coming online. So our team is really focused on supporting, you know, small, medium enterprise companies, startups, working with uh, the University of Windsor, working with St. Clair College, and even high school students. Like, you know, pre-pandemic, you know, one thing that's really sad is the pandemic really hit the brakes for us. We would host lots of different uh, information sessions and experiential learning opportunities at the VR cave. And we're hoping maybe by September we can do that again to get students excited and motivated into virtual reality, into simulation, into CAD modeling, into all of these technologies that are gonna be essential in as we move forward in, uh, in transportation, logistics, and so many other sectors. So I think that's where I'll kind of leave it. I just wanna you know, say, 
you know, embrace change, but also embrace technology. You know, a lot of people might be afraid of technology, but realistically, if we do this right, then, you know, it's complementary. And, you know, you don't have to replace a person's job, but the person's job and what they do may shift. And those autonomous trucks that might be coming down the road, um, you're still going to need potentially a safety driver, or you're going to need someone to pilot it from an actual uh, localized area, like a command center. So it just takes away the, the maybe the way the, the current industry sits right now, but it's just going to shift the way that jobs are, and it's going to help really open up some new doors. So, you know, I'm really excited. I love my job. Um, I'm really lucky. I've always been a car guy, always been, you know, involved with technology. And as you can see, my career definitely didn't have a traditional career path. And I just kind of went with the flow. And, you know, I'm grateful today. I have an amazing team. I, I have this uh, a couple of engineers that work under me as a part of our simulation team. And we get to work on some amazing projects to help some amazing companies. So, you know, I'll leave it there and, and wish everyone good luck. And, you know, please reach out if you have any questions. I'll be happy to, to help out. All right. Thank you so much, Jason. And again, it's interesting as uh, obviously touching on the role of changing technology in the transportation sectors are important too, but it's interesting too, because it seems like maybe indirectly you've touched on how important um, the spirit of collaboration is in the sector as a wider kind of almost um, uh, soft skill, if you, if you say that having people who are really willing to work in a team and work with other firms to kind of come to this greater solution through whatever you're having in the sector is really, really just as important as well too. And I'm, I'm so happy that you could touch on that and speak to that spirit. Thanks, Nick. It was great. Yeah. Collaboration is huge and we realize that we have to do that well. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. So now we're moving on to our last speaker of the day. Uh, I'd like everyone to welcome uh, Philip Marr. Hello. Oh. oh, hello, Phil. Hi. Uh, I think maybe the camera, I think, is not allowed to. You can't start your video because the call wasn't stopped. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there you go. I hey, think. no problem. How are you today, Philip? Good. How about you? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much. Thanks for ha thanks for having me today. It's a it's a real honor to to share about like my experience at um, the company I'm working at right now and and about transportation in general. Um, so yeah, uh, I could just introduce the company I work for. I don't have a background. I don't, I don't, <laughs> our security thing doesn't allow us to put like backgrounds, but I work for a, a telematics company called Geotab and we're based in Oakville. I'm actually based in uh, like Toronto. So, and the kind of model of Geotab is management by measurement. So what we have is we have these um, tiny devices called Go devices that hook up into the, uh, the OBD2 port of, trucks and vehicles and from there it sends out gps it sends out gps location signals and different things about the vehicle to a database where we can serve up these uh, data insights to our customers so i work as a data scientist at uh, geotab and i think the overall theme that i'll present uh, about my career is that uh, data science in transportation is really fun because it combines two things that i'm that i really enjoy so on one hand it's the math and geometry aspect of it, like dealing with data, the data that you get from transportation is very uh, visual, very uh, tangible, like you can, you can see it and you can visualize it really clearly. And secondly, it, because it, you can have a very tangible impact in the world. I'm sure, as all the other panelists have mentioned, transportation is something that is really essential to society in general. And, and being able to see like an impact, your impact on the world is very nice. Yeah, so okay, I can start off with uh, my career path, um, maybe starting from high school. I actually didn't go to high school in Canada. I went to high school in the Philippines. Um, and there I was focusing in high school a lot and doing math and physics. I really enjoyed math and physics because you could describe things really precisely and find answers in a very unambiguous and intuitive way. So for university, I decided to do, uh, to major in physics and math. I went to UBC in Vancouver. Um, so at first I started off, like, I really liked physics. I wanted to focus on physics because it had stuff to, it was really connected with the real world. But around second year, I pivoted hard towards math. I felt like at that time, math was a subject where you can be very clear about your assumptions and principles, and you could derive everything very in a principled way. Whereas in physics, you kind of have to sometimes make arguments that weren't always clear step by step. 
right? So one course in math that I really enjoyed that really solidified my choice to pivot to math was a basic real analysis course. So real analysis is kind of trying to build up calculus in a very, uh, a very what we call like rigorous, very principled way. And it tells, it teaches you how to prove things like, okay, why, why does this limit exist? Or, you know, why can we do an integral or why can we take a derivative? It's very, um, it's basically, you can ask questions like, why is this the case? Why is this the case? So I really enjoyed that. Um, after I did my undergrad, I went to the University of Toronto to do, uh, to do my uh, master's degree in math, um, but then realized that grad school in math is actually super difficult. It's like much harder than I, much harder than I expected. So um, instead of like applying for uh, the PhD, I decided to do a PhD in industrial engineering at U of T in optimization, um, which, is, which I think is the first time I got involved in things that are really relevant to transportation. So optimization is uh, kind of uh, an area of math where we're trying to decide what the most cost-effective way to do things is. I think uh, uh, one of the panels had mentioned before where um, it's, or I think it was Karen, you mentioned about like figuring out routing and figuring out like scheduling. This is, this is like an area of optimize. This is the area of optimization where you, you have a way to figure out what the best way to do things is. So I can give a very uh, simple example of optimization. So for example, if you had like a bread company and you have three different bread factories, one located in BC, one located in Ontario, and one located in Nova Scotia, and each of these bread factories, they have a certain amount of bread that they can produce in a given week, right? And you know that throughout the, throughout the country, there's different demands for bread, right? Like maybe Vancouver has like, you need to deliver bread to, uh, 200 different, uh, baker, uh, two different, 200 different stores. And in, in Saskatoon, uh, Saskatoon, and then you have to have, you know, 5,000, uh, 5,000 groceries that you have to deliver bread to. And then some in, um, some in Toronto or something, right? So optimization will help you decide, like, given how far you have to transport this bread, which cities that you want to supply from which factories, right? So it might be easy. Like if in Vancouver, it's clear, like you want to supply that bread from, BC, but if you have something that's like closer in between to the factory between BC and Ontario, like Saskatoon or Regina, for example, you might want to provide maybe half from Ontario and half from BC. Or if the BC one already supply is already the BC factory is completely filled, uh, or it's already um, its its capacity for making bread is already completely used up, maybe you have to supply from Ontario based on the distance, right? So th these kinds of questions are the kinds of questions that you used uh, in optimization. So I, doing my, um, my doctorate in that, that was a lot of applied math problems and it's actually quite useful for transportation. And then um, after I finished that, I moved to Canadian Tire working in their supply chain department and working on supply chain optimization. And it was actually a very similar problem to this. Like Canadian Tire has a bunch of uh, products and they wanna figure out what's the best way to ship these products. Do we ship it directly through Canadian Tire's warehouses to our stores, or do we ship it directly from the our vendors to the uh, shipping these products from where they're made into the individual stores? So this is kind of building programs to to figure which what's the best way to route these things are. So that was really enjoyable. Um, people there were like super supportive, super friendly, um, and um, at the time, it was one of those er one of the one of the times when like data the word data science was getting really popular and really hyped. So I decided to do a boot camp of sorts, and that one helped me get a job at a healthcare benefits administration company. And there I continued to learn how to work with real world messy data and learn other aspects of data of data science like communication, presentation, which is really important, uh, not just like the raw compu uh, programming and math. Um, yeah, after I worked there, I finally came to Geotab because the problems that uh, the company was working on were really interesting and the size of the data was really interesting. Like the amount of data that we're getting every day from the different vehicles that have this, have Geotab's Go device is, is an enormous amount, right? And it's really fun to be able to work with, with that volume, that large volume of data. Um, and I also felt like Geotab really had a product that it really helps companies manage their truck fleets, right? It's like very, it's a very concrete and I could see like what the contribution Geotab was making to uh, different companies and to society as a whole. 
So currently in my role, I work a lot with the data that's collected through these Go devices. Um, and in particular, there's a lot of data cleaning uh, and calculating things to provide insights to our customers. And what I mean by data cleaning is, um, and this is like a part that's not usually um, kind of, like when you hear data science, you usually think like, oh, machine learning, AI and stuff. But there's another aspect of it, which is like, for in order for the AI to work, you need to give it, like, you need to give data for it to learn things, right? And and sometimes data is not clean, right? Like you think something like uh, the date, the date, right? So that, you know, it's like, oh, that there's nothing to clean there. But in fact, there is actually, right? Like sometimes the format of the date is different. Like some people might say, um, what's today's date? Like May, oh, sorry, June 2, 2021. Other person might say 2nd of June, 2021. Someone might do 02, 06, 2021, 06, 02, 21, right? And so you have to take into account all these different things and try to standardize your um, standardize your data. So <laughs> that's that's a lot of a lot of work that goes into that, right? And doing it in a way that's you can do it for a large volume of data. You can't just manually go through each record because you might have millions and billions of records that you have pieces of data that you have to clean. So maybe a few things that I've learned throughout my career, and just take it with a grain of salt because I'm fairly new to this as well. Like uh, I've been working at Geotab maybe three months, um, and I was a Canadian tire maybe a year. So. Um, it's fairly new, but I think there are a few things that would that would have been helpful to know at the beginning, right? Um, I don't necessarily use the math that I learned in undergrad or graduate school. Like I don't do calculus on a day-to-day -day basis, but the skill of breaking down a problem and thinking about problems quantitatively and knowing how to prove things um, gives me a structured language and way to approach problems. And it's really, and I, I think that's like a very, a very valuable uh, skill to have. Um, another thing is, moving from an academic to an industry job, right? I think one of the things that, because I went to, I went to school for like a super long time, right? It's, I'm, I was so used to like, what's the perfect answer? What's the right answer? Give me the right answer, right? But um, what you learn is that eventually, you know, if I have a solution that's like 80 or 90% correct, um, and it would take me like a month to get, you know, 91 or 93%, it's really not worth getting those perfect answers, right? So it's learning how to figure out what's the most simple way to get the answer, right? It's not always about like what's fancy, what's like cool. It's about what gets the job done, right? Um, and then the last thing that I think would have been helpful and I'm, I'm still learning it is, is like putting aside ego, um, right? I think uh, Nikki were mentioning like collaboration and, and working well with other people. That's like really important, right? And I think um, because I was so used to wanting to look smart and like, um, wanting to say like, oh, I know the answer or look at this really cool program I built or whatever, right? Those, those things are not as important. It's really about um, putting your ego aside, like learning from your mistakes, learning from other people um, and, and collaborating with other people. Those things are, are like the most important part. Um, and, and again, like I love transportation because it's a, it's a, it is a place where you can do a lot of collaboration. There's a lot to learn um, and you're really doing something that impacts and helps other people, helps other people and helps society as a whole. Yeah, so happy to answer other, uh, any other questions. Um, yeah, thanks for, for listening. Yes, and, and thank you so much again, uh, Philip, because again, I was like, I had a couple of questions I was gonna ask and honestly, so comprehensive, you're able to answer them right away. It was, it was excellent. I'm, I'm really appreciative of that. And uh, speaking of that, um, we, I, we have some time at the end, I'll pass it off to, um, just let everyone know that in our chat, you can ask uh, in our Q and A section any questions for any of the panelists that we have. Uh, if anyone like would like to speak to any of that, so feel free to text those into the Q and A right below. And while you do that, I'm just going to touch on our career portal uh, once more. So you can check out uh, our essential worker career portal where you can read about these jobs and similar jobs, um, you know, our in-demand jobs. And you can also check out the transportation and warehousing career portal uh, where you'll see interviews uh, similar to um, the ones that you saw here today. I do want to bring up a couple of things. Um, Linda mentioned that anyone, um, any students or anyone looking for employment can check out uh, the City of Windsor Employment and Training Services um, and to also let students know that there are so many jobs that are expiring soon for anyone age 15 to 29 years of age. You just need to call them. I can drop that um, City uh, Employment and Training Services 
email, uh, contact email and phone number in the uh, chat where attendees can see it. In addition to that, uh, Ophelia uh, Dugal from the Greater Essex County uh, District School Board wanted to note that if someone wants to be a truck driver, uh, AZ driver, they can find an employer that will support their schooling. Uh, the school board can help um, with the Employment Assessment Center, uh, the GECDSB, sorry, Employment Assessment Center. Uh, they can assist you and the employer access um, and allow the employer to access the can Canada Ontario job grant so you don't have to pay for the cost of training. I will also drop Ophelia's email uh, for anyone in the uh, public school board. Does anyone have any other questions at this time? You can drop it in the Q and A, uh, drop it in the chat. And just after our Q and A period, I'll just have a brief poll that I'll be posting to the group, but that'll be after we have all our questions. Yeah. Okay, I don't see anything else here right now. Um, I'll give it another minute, um, but if you do have any other questions and you know they come up later throughout the day for students or any um, buddy that's interested in, in this sector has any questions about our panelists, about our information, um, I did share mine in Nick's uh, email. Oh, sorry, Linda mentioned it's not just the GECDSB uh, that has a job grant, it's across uh, the uh, all EO providers. Thank you so much, Linda. So that grants across all EO providers. Um, if you're with the public school board, you can uh, get into contact with Ophelia about that. Uh, you can also contact uh, the employment training services. Um, <clears throat> they all have access to it. Excellent. Thank you Great. so much. Nick, I'll pass along to you if you want to close out okay. our session. All right. Again, I'd like to thank all of our wonderful panelists that were able to participate today. Uh, we really appreciate that you took the time out of your day to kind of uh, provide a window into how important the sector is and how much you are um, involved in it and the wonderful work that you all do today. I'd like to thank all of our attendees that have tuned in today to take a watch. Again, after this is uh, completed, you'll be able to watch this recorded on Windsor, uh, workforcewindsoressex.com slash transportation. We'll have this uploaded in full. And just to close it up, I have a brief poll that I'll be post putting to our audience. If you could just vote that before you leave, that would be excellent. Poll is launched. And I'll just give a minute for everyone to participate in that. All right. Excellent. Okay. Mostly everyone that's been in today has been able to vote. There we go. Excellent. All right. Thank you again so much, everybody, for being able to participate. And thank you, Sam and Tashla and everyone who's helped out put this together. Uh, thank you again for tuning in to our virtual look inside transportation, and we hope that you'll be able to check out our transportation and warehousing career portal, as well as other resources we have at Workforce Windsor Essex. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day.